Hi everyone, I'm going to present a case of a patient in their mid-50s with severe sagittal malalignment because of lumbar degenerative spondylolisthesis. And here are the full standing AP and lateral x-rays of this patient. You can see that the patient has quite a significant mismatch of their pelvic incidence to a lumbar lordosis. Their lordosis is only 13 degrees with a PI of 72 degrees. Uh, from L4 to S1, they actually have a kyphosis of about 5 degrees, uh, giving them a total SVA of more than 20 centimeters. Here's a close-up of the lateral luxury of the lumbar spine. You can see here the grade 3 spondylolisthesis at L4, L5 going into kyphosis. And then you can also see that at L5S1, there is quite significant degeneration of the disc or disc space collapse. Now the patient had rheumatoid arthritis, so we also got flexion extension x-rays of the cervical spine that did not show any instability in the cervical spine. Uh, here's an MRI slice. It shows a quite significant foraminal stenosis bilaterally. Uh, from L4 to S1 on the sagittals that you can see. There's a lot of disc degeneration at L4, L5 and L5, S1. And then on the axials, you can see that there is significant facet arthrosis and severe spinal stenosis at L4, L5 and also moderate stenosis at L3, L4. Here's a CT scan of the same patient's uh, spine. You can see that the facets uh, at L4, L5 and L5, S1 are quite eroded. Even at L3, L4, it's really eroded. Um, and then the collapse and degeneration uh, from L4 to S1. And even in the uh, supine position for the CT scan, uh, the spondylolisthesis uh, reduces a little bit, but it's still uh, between uh, almost a grade 2 to grade 3. You can see the facet hypertrophy that's shown here on the axials and erosion at L4, L5. Here's a 3D model of the spine, again just showing more clarification of what's going on. You can see the spondylolisthesis at L4, L5 and the complete collapse uh, at L5, S1 as well as the facet uh, arthrosis and erosion at L3, L4. My plan for this patient was to perform a posterior instrumentation from L2 to S1 and ilium. The reason for going up to L2 was due to the osteopenic quality of this patient's bone and the high risk spondylolisthesis, which could create a lot of stress if we fused only to about L3. Uh, obviously, we were then planning on fusing from L2 to S1. I also planned on performing a posterior column osteotomies uh, from L3 to S1. Uh, to get the lordosis, especially the distal lordosis from L4 to S1, and I performed uh, transframinal uh, intrabody fusions from L4 to S1 again to uh, decompress the spine, uh, to mobilize the spine, and also to get the lordosis. And so, here the first step that we did here was after exposure was to put uh, screws in, we put iliac screws and then segmental fixation at each level. And next, I actually uh, first put temporary rods in to really use those temporary rods to reduce the spondylolisthesis at L4, L5. You can see the temporary rods here. Um, and then I performed the intrabody uh, fusions at L5, S1 and L4, L5.
and then place my permanent rods in place and then I used compression from L3 to S1 to get the lower doses that we needed to get for this patient. And here you can see the post-op standing films for this patient in the AP and, and lateral view and we can see a very nice restoration of the lumbar lordosis for this patient compared to what she had prior to surgery. Here are the full length films. You can see that now this patient is standing up perfectly straight. She is not bending her hips or knees and she's not compensating from anything else. This is a comparison of pre-op to post-op. You can see post-op she is now standing perfectly straight. She's not bending her hips or knees to compensate. Whereas pre-op she had severe sagittal malalignment and was trying to compensate from her hips and knees but still was unable to stand up straight. Thank you for listening uh, to this case and watching this video. If you have questions or suggestions, uh, please uh, feel free to leave them in the comment section. Thank you very much.